Hi guys, just to let you know, I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to listen to playing at the end of this episode, so please stay tuned until then. Hi M&Ms, welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. I can imagine one of most people's worst fears is being murdered by a complete stranger, which essentially dictates that you never know when you may cross paths with someone with nefarious thoughts. A potentially worst fate, however, is being murdered and your killer never being caught, or being murdered and your body never being recovered. For two families, this fear became reality when two young girls met both of these dreadful fates. Melanie Hall was born on the 20th of August 1970, and she lived in Bradford-on-Avon, which is about 10 minutes down the road from me, and it's actually where my granddad grew up. Now, I visit Bradford-on-Avon a lot. It's an idyllic, historic, beautiful town with a population of about 9,400 at the last count in 2011. There's a canal that runs through it. You can watch canal boats go through the locks. And there's a pub where you can sit on a boat out on the water to eat. I'm not sure how well I'm describing it, but I love it there. It's such a peaceful, nice place to be. Melanie was described by her parents as young and vibrant. Now, I didn't know this, but Melanie actually worked as a ward clerk at the hospital I work at now in Bath at the time of her disappearance. On Saturday the 8th of June 1996, Melanie planned on spending the evening with her boyfriend, Philip Carlbaum. Her mother, Pat, dropped her off at Philip's house and the pair ended up going out in Bath with another couple that they knew. The two couples went to Cadillac's nightclub where it's reported that Melanie and Phil had an argument after he saw her dancing with another man, causing him to leave upset. Melanie was last seen sitting on a stool in the club next to the dance floor at about ten past one in the morning. Her parents, Pat and Stephen Hall, reported her missing on the 11th of June when she failed to turn up for work. Avon and Somerset Police quickly launched an investigation into her disappearance. They searched the River Avon and interviewed thousands of clubbers and taxi drivers that would have been out in Bath the night she went missing. A £10,000 reward was offered for information that would lead to finding Melanie. Her case was presented on Crime Watch and her sister made a public appeal for information. All to no avail. Melanie was declared legally dead on the 17th of November 2004. On the 5th of October 2009, a motorway worker was working on the northbound slip road at Junction 14 on the M5 when he noticed a black bin bag. When he opened it, to his surprise, he found that the bag contained a skull, pelvis and thigh bone, with other remains being subsequently found buried around the field next to the motorway. Police were quickly able to establish that these remains were definitely human. At the site, they found a piece of jewellery, Melanie's grandmother's wedding ring that she'd been wearing at the time that she went missing, which Pat and Stephen were both able to confirm was the ring Melanie was wearing. Even though they had this identification, police refused to confirm the body was Melanie's until a post-mortem was performed. On the 7th of October, the post-mortem was undertaken and they were able to officially identify the remains as those of missing 25-year-old Melanie Hall by using dental records. 
The post-mortem was unable to identify a cause of death, but it did reveal that Melanie had suffered blunt force trauma to her head, leaving her with a fractured skull, cheekbone and jaw, and she had also been tied up with blue rope. Pat and Stephen launched a new appeal on the 8th of October for any information that would help find their daughter's killer. On the 29th of October, police revealed they'd found three keys to a Ford vehicle, either a transit, fiesta or escort, near Melanie's remains and were working with Ford to try and identify the vehicle. However, that was 10 years ago and I can't find any updated information about the keys, so I have to assume they led the police nowhere. Crime Watch also issued a further appeal for information related to Melanie's murder, which resulted in over 200 calls from the public, and the reward for information leading to an arrest was increased to £20,000. Now, while the case went cold super quickly, and to this day, Melanie's killer has never been caught, that doesn't mean there haven't been suspects. In fact, 11 people were arrested related to Melanie's disappearance and murder, but none of them were ever charged. Two men were arrested in 2003, but police were able to confirm they weren't involved in her disappearance after searching buildings and a field near Bath. A 37-year-old in Greater Manchester confessed to Melanie's murder in 2009. However, he was removed from the inquiry after he underwent psychiatric tests. A 38-year-old man was then arrested in July 2010 on suspicion of Melanie's murder, but again was released on bail. A year later, in August 2010, A 39-year-old man from Wiltshire handed himself in at a police station in the Avon and Somerset area and was subsequently arrested for Melanie's murder, but he was also released on bail. The police released that they had a white Volkswagen Golf that may be related to the inquiry in October 2014 and also had received information relating to the rope used to tie up Melanie's body. A 44-year-old man was arrested at his home in Bath on the 25th of November 2013 on suspicion of Melanie's murder, but was released on bail until the 19th of December when a house in Bath was searched. An entire year later, On the 28th of November 2014, it was revealed that police didn't have enough evidence against the 44-year-old to charge him. The next arrest came about six months later on the 23rd of June 2016 after forensics found DNA at the location Melanie's body was found. But again, he was released on bail a few days later. In October 2019, police confirmed that they had a partial DNA profile from the blue polypropylene rope, which is commercially made and typically used on building sites, that was used to tie the bag that contained Melanie's remains, and they stated that they remained confident that her killer will be caught. They also theorise that there may be more than one person involved in this murder, potentially one who murdered Melanie and another who dumped her body along the M5 in Gloucestershire, about 30 miles north of where they assume she was killed. They believe the person who dumped Melanie's body must have known the area well and it was probably hastily dumped rather than planned. We know that on the 8th of June leading into the 9th in 1996, Melanie was wearing a pale blue silk dress with a round neck, black suede mule shoes with a strap across the front and open toed, a cream single-breasted long-sleeved jacket and a black satchel handbag. 
These, along with makeup, a checkbook, bank card, watch with expanding bracelet, and some silver drop earrings are all missing and have never been found. The reward has increased further to £50,000 offered by Melanie's parents and now sits at £60,000 after Crime Stoppers added £10,000 for information that would lead to an arrest and conviction. Melanie's father, Stephen, who previously served as a chairman for Bath City Football Club, released a statement a few months ago. Quote, It is now over 23 years since our youngest daughter, Melanie, was murdered, probably on the streets of Bath. Since that time, the Avon and Somerset police have poured endless resources in their attempt to find her killer. Sadly, as yet, this objective remains unfulfilled, although I and my family remain eternally optimistic that eventually they will be successful. This is a tale of two families who, although possibly living quite close to each other, are worlds apart. Sadly, in the summer of 1996, the paths of these two families crossed. In one home resides a fairly ordinary family whose members, although not perfect, strive to work hard, respect their fellow citizens and uphold the law. In the other home, there lives a very different family, separated from the rest of society, a family governed by a very different code of conduct and one that lacks the moral fibre that binds the majority of our human race together. Within that family is the person who murdered our daughter Melanie, and who probably still resides in or near the city of Bath, surrounded by his or her version of their family and friends. In our family, we will forever grieve for and miss our lovely daughter, a young woman whose life stretched before her until that fateful night in June 1996, when that life was so cruelly snatched from her. She will never fulfil her life's ambitions, never marry, never have children, and my wife and I will never have another grandchild. Her mother's lasting memory of her youngest daughter is the day she viewed a battered skull and a few broken bones in the coroner's office at Porter's Head. We have little hope that Melanie's murderer will ever be caught as a result of information from a member of the public. The lives of the person responsible and those others who know what happened that night are governed by a totally different set of rules and moral responsibilities from the rest of us. We are sure that, after all these years, they will happily take their awful secret to the grave, as we will do the same with our grief. I take stock. A daughter who is dead a wife who just stares at the wall, a sister who struggles to get her day together, a 100-year-old grandmother who sits in a home with soft memories, and a father who puts it all in a box and tries to shut the lid, so we all carry on. I have no concern for that person who lives in the other family, a family with which I cannot identify and whose lifestyle is beyond my comprehension. Like the beasts in the field that devour each other, He or she probably thinks that their actions that night and their lifestyle are completely justified. For the sake of all those in the Avon and Somerset police, I hope they are successful in bringing someone to justice, for they have really put up a maximum effort to find Melanie's killer. Unfortunately, should they be successful, this will not bring closure, as only the return of Melanie alive will achieve that, and that is gone forever. I am often asked what... If Melanie's killer or killers were brought to justice, I would like to see happen to them. Quite simply, nothing that the judiciary system can do will bring Melanie back, and my real thoughts towards her killer are totally unprintable. End quote. So, this is your chance to help. Are you Melanie's killer? Do you know who killed her? Did you or do you know who dubbed her body on Junction 14 on the M5, either in the early hours of Sunday the 9th of June 1996 or in the days following? Did someone you know change after this date? Did their demeanour change? Are you concerned about someone's intent interest in this case? Do you know where Melanie's clothes and belongings are? Did you see Melanie Hall after ten past one in the morning of the 9th of June 1996? Did you see her leave Cadillacs? If you hold any information, 
please contact your local police station right now. Melanie's family, despite knowing it won't bring their beloved daughter back, are desperate for answers. Let's finally get justice for this 23-year-old murder. Now, Melanie's murder has been linked to several other cases, one of which I will tell you about now. Susie Lampley was born on the 3rd of May 1961 in Cheltenham and became an estate agent in her early 20s. On the 28th of July 1986, 25 year old Susie Lampley left her office at about 12.40 pm with her house keys and car keys and purse. She had an appointment shortly after to show a man we only know as Mr Kipper around a property that had not long come up for sale just a week earlier. Witnesses reported seeing a woman who resembled Susie talking to a man at about 1pm outside the house before getting into a car together. Minutes went by and then hours but Susie never returned to the Fulham office of Sturgis and Sons. Her bosses became concerned, so phoned Susie's late mother Diana, inquiring as to whether she had seen her daughter, wondering if maybe she'd stopped him for lunch afterwards and lost track of time. Diana recalls Susie's boss telling her that Susie never returned to the office after showing a client around a house and she immediately knew something was wrong. As we hear in most of these cases, it was completely out of character for Susie to just disappear. In her office diary, there was an entry. 12.45, Mr Kipper, 37 Shorolds, O.S., Shorolds referred to Shorolds Road in Fulham, London, where the property was located, and OS meant outside the property. Six hours after Susie left the office, with still no sign of her, her boss phoned the police and officially reported her missing. Later that evening, at about 10pm, Susie's white company Ford Fiesta was found outside of another property for sale in Stevenage Road, about a mile and a half away from Shorold's Road with the handbrake off. Her keys were missing and the only thing found at the scene was Susie's purse in the glove compartment. There seemed to be no signs of a struggle. An eyewitness saw a black left-hand drive BMW at the location Susie's car was found, which police believe may be involved in her disappearance. For a while, police believed Mr Kipper was Susie's pronunciation of a Dutch name, however they couldn't find anyone with that name that was connected to Susie in any way, and it's since been theorised that Mr Kipper may not exist at all, and may have just been a cover story, or at least the diary entry was a cover story, but for what, no one knows. Word quickly spread about Susie's disappearance, and police were very quickly gravely concerned for her safety. The day after she went missing, the London Evening Standard printed an article on Susie entitled quote, Kidnap Fears for a State Agent's Girl, end quote. Diana, desperate to find her missing daughter, celebrated her 50th birthday on the 30th, where loads of journalists turned up. However, Diana welcomed them with open arms. She saw it as a possible way of her daughter being found. The further the story went, the more people it reached easier it should be to at least get some more information about what happened to Susie. But the media presence didn't help Diana's growing concerns for her daughter's safety. Three days after Susie disappeared, her parents Diana and Paul appeared on television, pleading for their daughter's safe return. Diana told the public of her fears, saying, quote, I feel she is shut up somewhere, that she is being cowed against her will. I feel that because she hasn't contacted us. She's a very strong, very fit lady, so she should be able to cope with most situations. A week after Susie disappeared, with still no sign of her and no new leads, Diana admitted on BBC TV's London Plus that her fears were growing stronger each day 
and now she believed there was a chance they may not find their daughter alive. And it seemed like the police were starting to come to the same heartbreaking conclusion too. In an effort to locate Susie, police tested DNA of eight hundred unidentified bodies and skeletal remains that matched her description. However, again, these efforts came up completely empty. As with Melanie Hall, Susie Lamplew was declared legally deceased in 1994, presumed murdered. Investigations restarted in 1998 and 2000, both of which still failed to find Susie and her case was presented in 2002 on Real Crime, a documentary series produced by ITV that examined notorious British crimes. In November 2002, there was speculation that John Cannon, a convicted killer and rapist, could have murdered Susie. This speculation was aroused by the fact that John was released from a prison hostel just days before Susie went missing and his belief that his nickname in prison was Kipper. Scotland Yard held a press conference that month whereby they named John Cannon as a suspect in Susie's murder, with John denying any involvement in her disappearance. Police investigated him thoroughly however failed to come up with any evidence that linked him to Susie, but he wasn't removed from the inquiry altogether. In April 2001, a former girlfriend of John's told police that Susie's body may be buried in a former military base in Worcestershire, however a fellow prisoner of John's told police in December 2002 that her body was actually buried under the patio of John's mum's house in the West Midlands. A search was carried out at the former barracks in December 2000 and February 2001, and also in December 2000, police searched nearby brickworks which had been mentioned in several witness statements. John's mum's former house was searched in 2002, and then searches ceased for years until 2010, when police began searching a field off the B4084 about three miles from the former barracks. However, once again, all these searches came up empty. In October 2018, John's mum's former house was searched again, this time a lot more thoroughly, with the garage even being dismantled. They began removing the garage's concrete floor while also searching the garden. However, just a month later, in November, police announced that they'd ended the search and they'd found no evidence linking John to Susie's disappearance. In July 2019, police revealed that they were searching areas of land in Worcestershire, with the search being expected to last two weeks. But again, I couldn't find any information relating to this, so I haven't got any updates on that search. Now, at the start of this episode, I mentioned these cases have been loosely linked over the years. That's because John Cannon was also questioned in Melanie Hall's murder, and then seemed to discuss it as the perfect abduction with a cellmate about a month later. John Cannon was actually in prison at the time of Melanie's murder and had been for about eight years after being convicted in 1988 of another murder and a rape. An article published in the Daily Mail in 2009 suggests that John may have planned the whole thing from his cell as a way to taunt the police. According to an informant who visited John in prison in the 90s, he had been receiving letters from a woman in Bath who refused to give her name or number or ever visit him, claiming to be besotted with a convicted rapist and murderer. 
This theory emerged in the late 90s when the informant told police that John and a fellow inmate had planned the perfect abduction just weeks before Melanie's disappearance. Christopher Clark, a convicted rapist, is believed to have been John's accomplice and committed the murder not long after he was released. Police did interview Christopher in relation to Melanie's disappearance, however had no evidence linking him to it. Just a month later, Christopher attacked another woman in Bath and was jailed for life. So, as with Melanie's case, you can help. Do you know what happened to Susie? Do you know who Mr Kipper is, or who she was planning on meeting at the property on the 28th of July 1986? Are you that person? After Susie's disappearance, Diana and Paul set up the Susie Lamplew Trust, promoting and teaching personal safety. The issue hadn't been raised much at the time, so their aim was to promote awareness, to teach people how to remain safe. They became experts in personal safety, with their belief and aim simple. Personal safety should be taught at a young age. And that's exactly what Diana did. She travelled constantly around the UK, teaching people how to keep themselves safe talking to whole school assemblies and smaller class groups, whilst Paul worked tirelessly in the background, seeking funding for more projects and managing a small team they had developed at home. Heartbreakingly, both Paul and Diana passed away. Diana of Alzheimer's in 2011 and Paul passing away in his sleep on the 12th of June 2018, having suffered for years with Parkinson's, without ever finding out what happened to the daughter they described as fun, positive and thoughtful. If you have any information that could lead to finding Susie Lamplew or Melanie Hall's killer, please contact your local police station now. Let it not be a secret that you take to your grave with you. Someone out there knows what happened to both Melanie Hall and Susie Lampley. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com Have a great week and I'll see you all next week for another episode. Case Remains is a true crime podcast dedicated to missing persons and unsolved mysteries. Join me, Beth, every two weeks as we delve into some of the lesser-known unsolved cases from around the world. Until next time, stay safe.